a young student would vanish from a small town in Iowa. And the details which followed her disappearance would both unite and divide a nation at the same time. My name is Adrian, and welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. In today's video we'll be looking at the solved disappearance of Molly Tibbetts, and the turbulent twists in her story which followed. So who is Molly Tibbetts? How did she disappear? What made the nation rally together, and what pulled it apart? Just a quick heads up, but I post both solved and unsolved cases here on a weekly basis, so if true crime is your kind of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffeehouse Crime. So pull up a seat my friend, grab a coffee and sit back. This is the case of Molly Tibbetts. Welcome to the state of Iowa, a new location to Coffeehouse Crime's map. But really, what is Iowa known for? It's got a cool bridge, and it was also apparently the birthplace of sliced bread. But other than those two facts, there's not a lot to talk about when it comes to the Hawkeye State. Oh, but there is one more thing. Corn. Lots and lots of corn. Iowa was the home state for a bright young woman who went by the name of Molly Tibbetts. Originally, Molly spent her youngest years in San Francisco. She was born there on the 8th of May 1998 to her mother Laura and father Rob. And alongside Molly, she had two siblings, her older brother Jake and younger brother Scott. Molly was very fortunate to have a very healthy and nurturing upbringing. She had two loving parents and she had a good start in school. But it was shortly into her second grade that life threw its first curveball at Molly. Although things were working out for her, things weren't the same for her parents, and reluctantly, the two divorced shortly after. The breakup was hard, but Molly's parents needed space from each other, and so in the year 2007, Molly, along with her mother and brothers, moved to Brooklyn, Iowa. Brooklyn, Iowa was where her mother had grown up, and now Molly would have the same chance to experience her teenage years in this laid-back town. Granted, the move was painful for Scott, for Jake, and for Holly. Not just geographically, but emotionally too. But with good faith from their parents, their father Rob kept a close relationship with his kids. And although he couldn't physically be there with them all the time, he wanted to do his best for them. Brooklyn, which is about 70 miles east of Des Moines, is a small town. With a population of just 1400, life here is calm and slow very different to the hustle and bustle found in San Francisco. Their time surrounded by cornfields slowly turned from days, into months, and eventually into years. And before they knew it, Molly and her two brothers had fully settled into their new town. Molly would go on to attend Brooklyn Guernsey Malcolm Jr. Senior High School, but let's just call it Brooklyn High School from here. And while at Brooklyn High School, Molly would fully grow into her own personality. She was a social butterfly and made plenty of friends, often taking the role as the peacemaker in any situation. Molly Tibbetts was bright, energetic, positive and playful. She was the true definition to a people person, and she had a heart of gold. And speaking of hearts, it was in the year 2015 that Molly first set her eyes on a man named Dalton Jack. Dalton, who was a senior at Brooklyn High School, was an avid sportsman. It was late in the cold evening of October that he and his friend were sitting in a pickup truck after a game of football. They were then approached by a couple junior grades, and one of them was Molly. Dalton fell for Molly almost straight away. She made him laugh, and he thought she was cute. They shared numbers, and soon after, started sharing dinners and movies together. And from here, the two fell in love. Molly was smitten, and to Dalton, she was his world. Their affection and commitment to one another would grow over time, and two years later when Molly left Brooklyn to start a psychology major at the University of Iowa, she held on to him. While Molly lived and studied in Iowa City, Dalton stayed back home in Brooklyn to take up a career in construction. But that didn't stop the flow that he had with Molly. The two would see each other almost every weekend, and even on the weekdays when they could. The distance from home didn't seem too bad for Molly either. In fact, her first year at university flew by, and near the end of May 2018, she returned home to Brooklyn for the summer. 
During her break back home, she kept herself busy. By day, she would work at a local children's day camp at Grinnell Regional Medical Centre. And in the evenings, she made space for some extra studying to prepare for her sophomore year. She would also find time to go out for a run most evenings, once the sun had set. Her days back in Brooklyn were split between her mother's home and her boyfriend's home, which was located on the western outskirts of town. Dalton, who, unlike university students, didn't have the luxury of summer holidays. He would work most weekdays, and sometimes his work was local, at other times it could be across the state. Being in construction, it very much depended on the project. It was on the 18th of July 2018, in the middle of Iowa summer, that Molly was staying at Dalton's house. He shared his house with his brother and his dogs. But both he and his brother were out of town for work. Dalton's current project, which was located on Highway 61 near Dubuque, meant that he was over 130 miles out from home for the rest of the week. And as such, Molly promised that she would look after his dogs for him while she worked and studied in his house. The weather in Iowa that day was hot. And by hot, I mean 88 Fahrenheit hot. Molly had kept herself indoors that day to keep cool, in the company of Dalton's dogs and a laptop as she waited for the temperature to go down. The day was ordinary like all others. In Molly's downtime, she would Snapchat a boyfriend, find something to eat, or go on Twitter. There really was nothing unusual about it. And as the sun set, she found respite from the heat. The perfect time to go for her routine run. So around 7.30pm, she left her laptop open, sent Dalton a selfie, put on her running gear, and headed out into the cornfields for her daily exercise. But Molly failed to return home that evening. In fact, she wouldn't return home at all. Dalton, who never got a reply from her that night, assumed that she was just busy and fell asleep. But the next morning, when messages from Molly still remained silent, Dalton began to worry. He reached out to friends to ask them if they'd heard from Molly, but just the same as him, nothing and all of her social media remained silent too. And when Dalton received a call from her supervisor to ask why she'd missed a day of work, that's when the panic really started to set in. Molly was punctual, she'd never missed a day before from her seasonal job. This was entirely out of character. Something bad had happened to Molly, but what exactly had happened, he didn't know. Sometimes, silence can be the loudest kind of noise. And in this case, that was very much true. It seemed that Molly had just vanished off the face of the earth. And for an action so out of character, the quietness was insufferable for Dalton, her family, and her friends. By the end of the day, police and the local community had sprung into action with concern. Missing posters were distributed all around town, and the area outside of town was searched as best as possible. Volunteers all across America pitched in to find Molly, and to those who couldn't travel to search for her physically, donations and awareness was raised online instead. And very shortly after, Molly's father himself flew from his home in California to be part of the search team. But with Iowa experiencing the height of summer in the middle of July, the days were long and hot. And with cornfields all around, visibility was jaded, making it hard to look much more than several feet forward. And with Brooklyn being so close to Highway 80, she could be almost anywhere in the US within a matter of days. The still developing story, the search for Molly, the search is widening with these missing person posters now being circulated throughout the Midwest. Good afternoon, everyone. Authorities and the family say there's no new information to share, but they're keeping up the search. University of Iowa student 20-year-old Molly Tibbetts went missing last Wednesday in Brooklyn. She was dog-sitting and was last seen by a neighbor going out for a jog wearing shorts, a sports bra, and running shoes. Authorities are not ruling out foul play. People have been distributing flyers, posting them throughout the state and into Minnesota. The family posted on Facebook that the investigative team has been working on many fronts, but we are at that point where results take time and we'll keep you updated. So where was Molly? Well, at this stage, nobody knew. There was only one confirmed sighting of her by a friend of Molly's family that had seen Molly running east of the town that evening. But other than that information, 
police had nothing else to go off of. As the days turned into weeks, a reward for information on her whereabouts continued to grow. That sum would almost eventually reach $400,000. And investigators received thousands of tips too. They even rolled out an interactive website to help jog the public's memory, and looked into Molly's data from her fitness tracker to figure out where she had run to. But despite all these efforts, nothing seemed to come to light. That was until mid-August. It was during that time that the one key clue to her disappearance finally came in to investigators. A neighbour, who had lived in the northeastern area of Brooklyn, had been scrolling through a security camera footage when he noticed something strange. He shared his footage to police officers, and what they found as a result was of great interest. Bearing in mind, this camera is three minutes slow. But at 7.45pm on the day of her disappearance, the security camera picked up what is alleged to be Molly jogging along Boundary Street. And not even 20 seconds later, a black Chevy Malibu with chrome side mirrors, handles and rims was spotted driving from the direction of the jogger. Nothing strange yet, but then the same car was spotted just seconds later on a street. And not even two minutes after, at 7.51pm, the Chevy Malibu was recorded on the first camera again, doubling back from the direction it came, towards the jogger. And again at 8.07pm, same Chevy, same direction, but this time, faster. Christina Stewart's sighting of Molly, who was running east of Brooklyn on 385th Avenue, checked out with the jogger's timing on the security camera. It is very likely that, with both the footage and Christina's account, the runner was indeed her. And with that said, the vehicle, which seemed to exhibit strange activity at the very time and location of Molly's disappearance, was suddenly of great interest to police. Investigators searched for the car. I can't say they searched very hard, because in a town of just 1400 people, with a car that distinctive, yeah, it didn't take them very long to find it. Only one day after viewing that footage, a deputy who was on duty at the time managed to spot that car on the road. He didn't stop the car, just merely followed it, until the driver stopped himself. The deputy approached the driver's window, and it was eventually found out that the car belonged to that driver. His name was John Budd. John was asked about Molly's disappearance. He replied saying that he had no idea or involvement with Molly, and therefore, he was allowed to leave. But John's time away from officers didn't last very long. In fact, it was only two days later that officers arrived at his employer's dairy farm. And suddenly, they noticed that he was now driving a different car, this one belonging to his girlfriend. So at this point, investigators were interested in John, but they didn't have any evidence linking John to Molly's disappearance. So instead, investigators invited John down to the local police station to ask him more questions. John had no obligation to satisfy their demands, but decided to go ahead with it anyway. And so down to the police station they went. Call it cold feet, or call it good interrogation, but after hours of being interviewed by police, John had a confession to make. John Budd was not actually called John. Instead, his legal name was Christian Bahina Rivera. He was a man aged 24 at the time, and he lived and worked in the rural area of Pauchique County, just outside of Brooklyn. Originally from Guerrero in Mexico, John, or Christian, arrived in the United States at the age of 17. But not lawfully. He was not legally allowed to work in America, and had actually slipped the system. Christian, who had now been living in Iowa for several years, had worked in a couple farms since entering the US. His current place of employment was Yerubi Farm, near Brooklyn, Iowa. Back in the interrogation room, investigators were getting comfortable with Christian, and while asking him if he knew where Molly was, he admitted that he had in fact seen her on the evening of her disappearance. He claimed that he had spotted Molly before deciding to approach her. He then started running next to her before striking up conversation. And second time wasn't the charm either. When he persisted by her side, she pulled out her phone and told him to leave, or she was going to call the police. And apparently next, Christian blacked out. When the next day, the 21st of August, rolled around, the morning brought some terrible news with it. 
After over 10 hours of interrogation, Christian agreed to lead police officers to a specific patch of land outside of Brooklyn. It was remote, and as police officers got out of their vehicles to walk closer, they noticed a clearance between the corn stalks. And as they approached, their greatest fears were confirmed. They had finally found the body of Molly Tibbetts. She was found underneath a layer of corn stalks, partially clothed, wearing only a sports bra and socks, and it was clear that, due to the level of decomposition, her body had been there for some time. Christian confessed that after approaching Molly as she ran, when she threatened to call the police, he reacted by killing her in a panic, and eventually hid her body in a cornfield. She had been stabbed 7-12 to 12 times in the chest, ribs, neck, and skull, and tragically, she had died from these sharp force injuries. Upon hearing the news, families, friends, acquaintances, and searchers for Molly were all in despair. Her silence, which had kept the town and the nation on the knife's edge for weeks, crashed down on them with devastation. And when they learned of the details of her death, that devastation grew with anger. Anger that would find its way into the political spotlight. Donald Trump himself blaming her death on the actions of an illegal immigrant from Mexico. And on August the 22nd, Christian Rivera was charged with first degree murder. And upon noticing that he was a flight risk, his bond, which was previously set at $1 million, was increased to $5 million. As the story of Molly Tibbetts changed from a disappearance to homicide, events around her case would continue to unfold, both behind bars and in the real world. Rivera would go on to plead not guilty the following month. Despite initially confessing that he had killed Molly Tibbetts, he now entirely retracted that statement. But investigators were already busy making their own discoveries. The impounded black Chevy that belonged to Rivera was under close forensic scrutiny, and analysis would eventually find blood present in the boot and on the rim of his car. Forensic analysts eventually matched the DNA profile found in the trunk of his car to Molly's known DNA profile. The discovery almost entirely confirming that Molly was in Rivera's trunk that evening. But a long series of events behind bureaucracy would delay his case making its way into the courtroom. Due to the publicity of his trial, it was pushed back several months and moved to another county over safety concerns. And then in August 2019, his defence team filed a 29-page motion asking for his interrogation to not be allowed as evidence, as he was apparently not properly read his Miranda rights at the time. This means that despite confessing that he had killed Molly, because he wasn't read out the famous statement, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law, they couldn't actually use his confession as evidence. Great. His trial was then delayed into 2020 after asking a judge for more time, which was granted. But then in 2020, coronavirus happened. However, you cannot stop time. And on May the 17th, 2021, Rivera's trial finally began. His defence team were quick to argue to the court that investigators violated his rights before charging him with murder. They also alleged that officers engaged in illegal tactics in forcing Rivera to connect himself to the crime. And when those tricks didn't seem to go down so well, they would eventually try to accuse Molly's boyfriend Dalton for her murder, claiming that he had cheated on her three years prior. But Dalton had a strong alibi during the time that she disappeared. He was almost two hours away with work, and several colleagues could account for his whereabouts. And it was also obvious how much he loved Molly. There was no motive behind such an accusation. Christian Rivera would eventually take the stand to testify. But this was not a smart move. Since his initial confession, Rivera's claims had changed from a guilty yet plausible story to shocking stupidity. He claimed to the jury that apparently two armed men had come to his house and forced him to drive them around town until they spotted Molly. And they then killed her, forced him to drive to the cornfield, and threatened him with his daughter's life if he told anyone what had happened. After allowing their client to take the stand with a story like that, well, good luck to the defence team in ever being hired again. With Rivera's not-so-compliant confession, leading police to Molly's body, the CCTV footage, Molly's blood in his trunk, and now the ludicrous story, Christian had thoroughly been backed into a corner. 
And on Friday the 28th of May 2021, Rivera was officially found guilty for the murder of Molly Tibbetts. The decision was reached just after 1pm, after only one day of deliberation. The jury taking just seven hours of active discussion to reach their verdict. Rivera, guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. Christian stayed silent and expressionless as the verdict was read out. The man showing less emotion than you'd expect while watching the weather forecast. There was, however, one more twist to this case. Christian Rivera was originally scheduled to be sentenced on July the 15th this year. But soon before that date, Christian's defence team sought for retrial after now claiming that two of Molly's childhood friends were to blame for her murder. And this, of course, was bullshit. The judge denied any form of retrial. However, it did push back his sentencing date. With that said, Christian Rivera is now expected to be sentenced later this month on August the 30th, which, according to my watch, is two weeks from the day that this video is published. And with the state of Iowa carrying a mandatory life sentence in prison, it's unlikely that anyone will ever have to worry about being caught by this man again. Call it leading with a good heart, or call it pure strength. But this case brought out true heroes in people who chose to climb out of the darkest moments of their lives, stare evil in the face, and pick kindness over anger. Following the political twist that Molly's disappearance never meant to attract, colleagues of Christian Rivera who had nothing to do with this case were targeted, bullied, and then fled Brooklyn, Iowa, leaving their 17-year-old son Ulysses Felix all alone at the ranch. With no family and no home, Ulysses had nowhere to go. But Molly's mother, Laura, wondered what Molly would have wanted if she were alive. And as a result, Laura adopted Ulysses, giving him an opportunity to remain in school and build himself a brighter future. And Molly's father, Rob, who spent every waking moment of his life searching for Molly while she was missing, was at the forefront of media coverage every day. It's clear to see where exactly Molly developed her friendly, open-hearted personality. Time and time again, her parents, who supported and loved Molly for every second of her life, chose love over hate, even in the moments where the latter option was the easiest. And with a foundation like that, it's obvious why Molly grew into the young adult that everyone loved. She was described as everyone's counsellor, equipped with an infectious laugh and a beautiful smile, working hard for her own bright future, one that was tragically taken from her. But the goodwill and strength didn't stop there. Following her discovery, hundreds of people from her community gathered at the University of Iowa to remember Molly. Many of those hundreds, the same people that had spent the last month searching for her through cornfields, in the middle of Iowa's summer. And now, every year, hundreds of runners from across the country travel to Brooklyn, Iowa to participate in the Molly Tibbetts Memorial Run in honour of Molly, and to raise funds towards child psychiatry at a local children's hospital. Being in this business of true crime, it's kind of obvious to say that these stories never really finish with a happy ending. At the end of the day, a life is always lost, leaving behind a distraught family and many friends. But this case in particular, it was a difficult one for me to cover. Molly had a lot going for her, she should have felt safe in what she was doing, and her life was cut way too soon. But for what reason? There are dozens of hours of trial footage of this case here on YouTube, and it's pretty obvious throughout the entire process how little Rivera actually cared. Anger doesn't quite cut it, this guy sucks. And a personal gripe, I know technically I'm only one myself, but it was really disappointing to see how many keyboard detectives were out there pointing the finger at Molly's parents and Dalton. Molly wasn't the only victim to this case, it was her friends and family that were too. Being accused with uneducated opinion is just adding salt to the wounds. Anyway, I'm going to leave it here for today folks. If you found this video interesting, or if you learned something new today, then please remember to like the video. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe to Coffeehouse Crime, it really does help me out. Thank you for watching today, and you know it by now, I'll be right here behind this camera waiting for you in the next one. Until that moment arrives though, look after each other. Goodbye.